So, good evening, everybody. Welcome. Uh, it's a really good turnout. I didn't realize I was so popular. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, here, we're here with Rick Archer. Sharon and I have known Rick and Irene for well, over 25 years. Uh, we uh, taught TM together. Actually, we were in the national organ TM organization in the uh, marketing branch of it. We used to go to cities and do TM lectures. And so we've known Rick for quite a while. And so I had the idea uh, about six months ago, I'm a waking down teacher, and I go to a lot of events throughout the United States. And people would come up to me and say, uh, you know, we start talking, and they find out I was from Fairfield. I say, Fairfield? Do you know Rick Archer? <laughs> but they wouldn't say it like, do you know Rick Archer? They'd say it like, do you know Rick Archer? <laughs> <laughs> and there was, I, we were in Australia doing some, some weekend uh, courses about a year and a half ago. And this fellow, you know, asked me where I was from. And he goes, Fairfield, Iowa. Do you know Rick Archer? <laughs> he saved my life. <laughs> and so, um, I had the idea it might be neat to uh, actually interview Rick, uh, who has done an unprecedented thing when you think about it. He's interviewed, <coughs> excuse me, almost 230 people. You have interviewed all these people and put it on the internet, and it's live. And so people not only get to hear these people, not just from reading about it or from, a, or from listening, but they get to see and get the feeling of the transmission of each of these people. And I've read a lot of the things that uh, people have sent to you about how their lives have been transformed by one person or another. Because uh, there's a lot of ways to get to California, and it's, it's, it seems that, that certain ways are uh, more conducive to some people than others. And when you have 230 people to listen to, the chances are, if you're motivated on a spiritual path, that, just, that this is going to be a great aid. In, in that endeavor. And so I feel privileged to be able to be with you today and to find out exactly uh, uh, why you got into this. Maybe we could, we could start with that. Sure. Well, um, for years I attended that satsang at Tom Trainer's house. Uh, many of you went to that one time or another. And, you know, dec almost 10 years he had that thing or something, a long time. And every Wednesday night, you know, I'd go there and I'd hear story after story of people who had had spiritual awakenings, people in Fairfield. Uh, some, sometimes they were just, you know, flashy experiences which came and went, but a great many people in town were having what we would call a, an abiding awakening, something which stayed once it, occur, you know, had happened. And many of those awakenings conformed quite clearly to the higher states model that, that Maharishi Mahesh Yogi laid out. Um, and so that was great. But a number of those people would say to me, or to the group, that they had mentioned it to a few friends once they had had this awakening, and the friends ridiculed them, or you know, scoffed at them. Uh, in fact, just the other day, I got a long Facebook message from this guy in Skelmersdale, which is the TM community over right, in right. England, and he said he had had this profound awakening, and he told his wife, now ex-wife, and, <laughs> and she said, no, that couldn't be. You haven't done enough rounding courses, enough long, long meditation courses, and you know, she didn't believe him. Right. And so a lot of times, you know, when people got that kind of reaction, they would right. shut up about it. Right. Now, at the same time, you know, I was running into other people around town who were saying things like, well, I don't ever expect to get enlightened in this lifetime. Uh, you know, I like meditating, it's restful, and I'll keep doing it. But, um, you know, nothing like that's ever going to happen to me. And so I thought, there's a disconnect here. Mm. Um, and what I thought, why don't I start interviewing people who have had awakenings, and then the people who haven't had them can hear that, and it, and it might make it sort of more of a norm in our community consciousness, and it wouldn't seem weird or strange or unbelievable, and mm. um, you know, it might actually facilitate more awakenings, might kind of be a catalyst. And so I thought that was a good idea, and I took the idea to Crew FM and, mm -hmm. and said, let's do this radio show. Um, and I did a little demo with George and Mary Foster, and 
Crew FM didn't want to do it. Yeah. Now that probably leads us to the next question. Why didn't they want to do it? <laughs> <laughs> well, at the time, I, I didn't understand why. Um, this is going to be easy. <laughs> <laughs> Crew FM, by the way, for those who are watching it on the internet, is this little radio station here in town, low power FM station with a 10 mile radius. I thought, cool, we'll get it out to this 10 mile radius. And uh, I couldn't understand why they didn't want to do it. It seemed like a perfect fit for our community. Uh, and so like three months went by and Tom Trainer kept bugging me, you know, do something, do more, you know, try to get, make this happen. And then, and then finally he said, forget Crew FM, take it to FPAC, the, the local public access TV station. Mm -hmm. So I said, okay. So I, I went to FPAC, talked to them, they were into it. So I started taping them there. And we did about 17 of them there with, you know, Stan Kens and you guys and the Boggs and, uh, you know, various other people around Fairfield. And, but they just didn't have their act together in terms of the technical thing. And so I was accumulating these shows on DVDs and they weren't going anywhere. They weren't airing on... Uh, we were doing the technical stuff as we went along. Yeah. You'd ask a few questions and then make a few adjustments. Right. They'd, turn yeah. the camera and you'd have to stand like this the whole interview for two hours. So, it's, so still nothing was happening to it. And then one night I, I was at one of those satsangs and uh, you know, I was kind of grousing about the fact that it wasn't getting off the ground. And Connie Zwig, who's from Malibu, happened to be there. Uh, with her husband and she said what are you thinking so small for you know it's Fairfield why don't you get it out on the internet somehow and you know bring it out to the world we'll watch it in California so I thought okay so I got in touch with a friend of mine and who was one of my best friends in high school in fact 50 years ago they were, they were just talking about the New York State uh, the, the World's Fair in New York City we went to that together when we were 14 and almost missed the bus going home so we've been friends ever since although we haven't seen each other since then but he had been a video professional all of his life right. and so right. I said can I send you these discs and have you turn them into something that I can put on the internet so I sent him a box of discs and he converted them to the necessary format put nice titles on them and everything sent them back so then I just had to figure out how to create a blog and how to create a podcast for the audio aspect with iTunes and how to you know create a YouTube channel and initially YouTube limited me to 10 minute segments so I had to split them up in little segments and upload the individual segments and uh, but you know, eventually once I reached enough views and uh, and videos they they gave me unlimited time so so I went back and re-uploaded them all in their entirety and um, then I started you know then I had to figure out how to I realized I was going to kind of run out of people in Fairfield maybe or it would be more interesting if I could get people outside of Fairfield yeah. Yeah. and so I had to figure out how to, to find um, another gas pump. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Isaac Nevis by the way thought up the term uh, Buddha the gas pump if you happen to know Isaac, young guy. Um, in any case I had to figure out how to get Skype to record and that was tricky uh, get, getting Skype recordings to look halfway decent and there was this company in Australia that I discovered made some software called Vodburner and they weren't used to people trying to do two-hour shows in high definition um, <laughs> so mm. we kept, the, the software kept crashing and having all these problems and I kept sending it back to you know sending them the problems they kept mm. fixing them at one point they sent me a hard drive to send them a whole show on so I could so they could work with it directly so the whole thing just kind of de kept developing like that right yeah right. and there's more detail but probably mundane fantastic yeah, yeah. It's, it's uh it's Horatio Alger is what it is <laughs> yeah, of the internet yeah. Uh, it, it brought up a question to me is, is that, you know, that whole idea of uh, uh, moving in a spiritual path toward enlightenment or toward awakening or greater perfection in life. And yet uh, there was quite, there was that uh, pushback with, if people came out uh, out of the closet, so to speak, to talk about something that they had realized which uh, was permanent, which was there. Why do you think that is, that that, that, that pushback was there? Because I, I experienced it myself. Uh, 1999, I had a spiritual awakening, and I was afraid to talk to people about it. And in fact, you're the first one I talked to. I don't know if you remember, mm. we, we had you and Irene over for dinner one night, uh -huh. and you were sitting there asking all these great questions. <laughs> and, <laughs> days of future past. And, and it was such a relief to be able to uh, to bring it forward mm -hmm. and to talk to somebody who uh, would hear it and listen and, and flesh it out, so to speak. And so uh, I think it speaks to uh, 
what awakening is and how people perceive it, that there's this uh, kind of a taboo about talking about it. Well, you know, I think the, the concept of awakening that people form over the years and enlightenment when they're reading books and listening to lectures and all that, uh, in many cases ends up being quite a far cry from the actual experience of it when it happens so that they don't actually connect the two when it does happen in some right, cases. Right, like right. for instance that book by Suzanne Seagal, uh, Collision with the Infinite. And she had been a TM teacher and done, you know, been on all these courses and everything. And then she kind of was living in Paris, got pregnant, was, you know, Right. coming back from a swimming thing at the at the pool and she was just getting on a bus and all of a sudden boom you know right. she had this right. profound shift right. and she was terrified uh, because there was a complete from her perspective loss of sense of individual self right. and she didn't connect it at all with any, everything she'd heard about enlightenment or cosmic right. consciousness and all that and went on for 10 years being terrified until she finally got together with Jean Klein right. uh, and he pointed out to her that, well, he said, he said stop trying to look for it, and, and, and it just relax into it, and mm -hmm. she realized it was a spiritual thing. She wasn't crazy. Right. So, well, that's part of the answer. Another part is I think that people, well, well it's kind of along the same lines. People have a concept of what enlightenment is supposed to look like. You, you seem really holy. Yes. You know, maybe you right. have a certain inflection in your voice, possibly right. Right. <laughs> something like that. Uh, and yeah, I think Christ said a prophet is not without honor except in his own home. I, right. I think that, you know, hey, it's facts. Mm -hmm. uh, how could he, you know, he's the same mm -hmm. old facts as mm -hmm. he ever was. His golf game is still mediocre. How could he? <laughs> <laughs> Why don't you tell the world? <laughs> you know, I don't see anything different about him. He doesn't seem special. Sure. You know, can you levitate? I mean, that's another one I've gotten sure. from a lot of people around town. You say, You've had a spiritual awakening, and maybe it seems like cosmic consciousness, as Marshi described it. Well, can you levitate? All right. It's Are not, you in bliss all the time? Yeah, then it's not real. If, not if, really. you, ha if you don't meet those criteria. Right, right. So. Now, I'm not saying that those criteria aren't, you know, real, you know, in certain instances. But uh, I think that the way that it shows up uh, in, in individuals, first of all, it's a surprise. Mm -hmm. Because if it, if it wasn't a surprise, it wouldn't be an awakening. And, it's, and if it's a surprise, then it's not going to relate to conceptions that you have about it, you know, from the path that you've been on. If you have, if you have a conception about it, then that's what you think is going to show up, and that's what you're kind of moving yeah, toward. Yeah, you're expecting a certain thing. And then uh, something shows up which is kind of like the penny dropping, mm -hmm. kind of like uh, nothing special, no lights going off, nothing, nothing, nothing special at all, really, except that it feels... You know, it's normal. You just feel normal, <laughs> and uh, and so there's a big transition there. In other words, because all of the things that your mind has created, that this is this, a, I, all these things have to fall into place in order for me to know myself. Uh, aren't there? The whole thing's different. Mm -hmm. And I, I remember just floundering around uh, trying to find some something solid to put my feet on, and. Uh, and it was, it was, I remember looking at this has to be in the Bhagavad Gita. So I got Maharishi Bhagavad Gita and I started going through it. Mm -hmm. Chapter one, oh, it's all attainment, attainment. I didn't attain anything. Uh, chapter two, chapter three, chapter four, chapter five. Got to chapter six, verse five. And he said, the self is revealed to the self through itself, by itself. No amount of meditation will reveal the self. And that, that clicked with what I had recognized that it had recognized itself, mm -hmm. and it, but the rest of it, all of the rest of it, I couldn't relate to at all. Mm -hmm. And so there was like that's what the awakening is: is that something happens. Now, in this, in this, um, in your interviews, do you find that that people? Uh, I know that a lot of the people come through certain traditions, and they have an awakening which is kind of within that tradition. It's described through that tradition. Whereas other people just kind of uh, fall into it on their own. Did you did you mm -hmm. did you notice that? Yeah, um, some people do fall into it quite spontaneously without any practice or interest, prior interest in this this sort of thing. I mean, there was a lady named Kieran. Um, 
who some, sometimes calls herself Mystic Girl in the City. And she was sort of an actress and fairly worldly person by her own admission, mm. by her mm. own definition. And you know, one morning she was tying her shoes and all of a sudden there's this profound opening. Mm. And you know, it took her a long time to figure out what in the heck had happened. Mm. Um, and in fact, it was so radical uh, when she finally did sort of identify it as a spiritual thing. She started going to spiritual teachers. She went and saw Adyashanti and she actually got up on the mic and started yelling at him. She said, you know, you, it, it's not right for you to be encouraging people to get this. They have no idea what it's going to be, you know. <laughs> um, what was your question? <laughs> yeah. it, was, it, was, it was kind of the distinction between awakenings that come through traditional ah, means yeah. versus people falling into it on their own. And yeah. I, not I, I noticed that some of the interviews, ha you have both in your... Uh, yeah, and it would be interesting for somebody who has a more of a sci sci sociological, scientific bent mm -hmm. to actually review all these things at some point and see how they could be categorized. And um, because I think it would be really valuable for our culture, to our spiritual culture, mm -hmm. which is mm -hmm. hopefully burgeoning, to have a more clearly defined uh, and systematized understanding of the territory. Right. Uh, of you know what awakening is and what it, its stages are if it has stages mm -hmm. and um, and so on so because otherwise what is it is it just some kind of individual world that you kind of live in without any correlation to other people who, who have su supposedly mm -hmm. had an awakening mm -hmm. by definition an awakening is supposed to be an you know an, a, 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 a conscious realization of the most fundamental reality of the universe mm -hmm. and. Do we each have our own most fundamental reality? Mm -hmm. I think not. And yet, at the same time, yeah. we each have our own individual nervous system. Right. And many traditions, um, including many things I heard Maharishi say, indicate that according to the makeup of your nervous system, awakening is going to have different flavors. For some people, it might be more bliss. For some, more you know, right. vastness. Right. Um, some people are in the heart. Yeah. And, some and for some, if there hasn't really been adequate preparation and purification, it can result in a, in a grandiose agra, you know, mm -hmm. ego trip. Mm -hmm. I mean, a person can be fueled with this, this shakti and think they're just the cat's meow and, right. and you know, right. start having people carry them around on their right. shoulders. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Not in Fairfield. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, this kind of brings up the idea of the relationship between uh, the physiology mm -hmm. and awakening. I mean, uh, the tradition that we, you know, went through uh, was uh, a purification of the physiology mm -hmm. through uh, through meditation and, and diet and and all and and all, and, all, and all the rest of it, so that the nervous system could support uh, higher states of consciousness. Uh, but many of the people that uh, were on the, uh, that you've interviewed, and I would put myself in this category and a lot of my friends, is that it, 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 I don't feel I have less stress now than I have in other times in my life. I feel that, that the self is something that's, that's inherently yours and, and, it, and it finds itself, so to speak. Now, directed through the mind, senses, but at some point, uh, through grace, through an accident, whatever, it, 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 this, con this consciousness becomes conscious of itself. And, and there's a shift in identity. It's not like a, a momentary thing where you just transcend and then come out. It becomes part of your identity. And it's something that's always there. And to me, the physiology, it, it plays a role in experience, but does it, does it play a role uh, in, in actually uh, in this awakening process, in, in the ownership of it, the shift of the identity. There was a Zen teacher, I forget his name, who said uh, spiritual awakening may be an accident, but practice makes you accident prone. Yes, yes, yeah. very good. And uh, maybe it's my in deeply ingrained background, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, and it actually, Marshi's teaching has a lot of roots in Kashmir Shaivism which talks a lot about the physiology and the importance mm -hmm. of <coughs> having it cultured to be able to sustain the shock of awakening. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's, you know, it's regarded, as I understand it, that 
you can get yourself into trouble if the physiology isn't adequately prepared mm -hmm. and there's some rising of the kundalini, you know, which is really strong. Um, you can go crazy, you can, you know, all mm -hmm. kinds of things can happen. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, physiologists, neurologists would tell us, even with no spiritual interest whatsoever, that anything that you're experiencing has some kind of correlation with the brain, right? right. With the nervous system, every little thought we think, every, every mm -hmm. experience we have. It would seem to me that something so experientially radical as awakening, as mm -hmm. we're defining it, mm -hmm. would necessarily, to my understanding, uh, correlate with some sort of radical change in the physiology. Whether, you know, neurologists can locate it, Fred Travis has devoted his life mm -hmm. to trying to do mm -hmm. that, uh, whether it would be something more subtle, uh, whether they're only getting 10% of the understanding of what's mm -hmm. actually happening, I don't know. Um, but that, that Zen quote, you know, spiritual practice mm -hmm. makes you accident prone. Sure, there are people who have been raging alcoholics and have, you know. Yeah, one of the fellows you interviewed. Uh, yeah, Fred Wayne Lickerman. Yeah, it was ironically guy. that was his was name. Another guy, Fred something. Fred Davis. Fred Davis. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> he uh, said he had an awakening uh, while he was under the influence. Yeah, Byron Katie was in some kind of halfway house, right. you know. Um, right. So. You know, we can seriously abuse our physiology and yet still have an awakening. But if I, I think that there's some kind of bell curve, mm -hmm. and that people who have that happen to them are probably on the fringes of the bell curve, mm -hmm. and that it's more likely that people who have actually cultured the nervous system mm -hmm. in some way are, you know, some of them aren't going to get mm -hmm. awakened. But there's, you're probably setting up the conditions for making it more probable. I would think. Or, That's, or, incidentally, a lot, everything I say tonight is based either on my experience, my uh, understanding, or my opinion, and generally a mixture of all three. Yes, and yes. all three are a work in progress. So yes, I could yes. say an entirely different thing a year from now. I don't right. claim to have any kind of authority about anything. Right. I understand. <laughs> I understand. And it, 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 it seems that, uh, that, this, that this process of awakening uh, in and of itself, it's 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 a spontaneous thing at times. In other words, it, it just it's th there can be two kinds of awakening. Now, there's a kind of awakening where the self recognizes itself, but then if the physiology has been cultured, then as it, it's as if it's as if there's a depth that can come from that. And and I would I would would not want to say that that what I've experienced that the awakening of I I have had is is synonymous with the awakenings that people have been in caves for 50 or 60 years, mm -hmm. culturing their nervous system. So it's, it's, it's almost as if we have a, 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 a fulcrum of identity. Mm -hmm. And uh, some individuals, they identify almost completely with this absolute pure bliss being. And other people have a taste of it, but enough so that they identify with it, they know it and they live it and it's 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 a part of who they are just like being an american or a male and and, and that's there and 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 there's a whole range of spectrum uh that that makes up our identity and so that's kind of how one paradigm that i look at when in trying to understand this because the more you go into it the more paradoxes there are about it is the, is the physiology is necessary the physiology isn't necessary and uh, a lot of the people that, uh, that you've interviewed have, have talked about this paradox. Uh, yeah, and I've talked about it a lot in interviews. In fact, somebody sent me a t-shirt that says paradox on it. Huh. <laughs> <laughs> Should have worn it. Um, Ajishanti, who you know, I respect as being one of the most um, down to earth and, yes. and yet in the clouds in a, in a good sense. Mm -hmm. Teachers out there, really highly evolved but very down to earth guy. Um, he, one thing he, he said recently, not too long ago, is he said, I always feel like I'm a beginner, you know? Mm -hmm. And I, I sort of feel like, just again, opinion here, but the, the, the range of possibilities for, you know, mm -hmm. spiritual evolution mm -hmm. is so vast that virtually everybody is a beginner. At least it's healthy to sort of maintain that attitude. That's mm -hmm. something Amma says in practically every lecture. She said we should always have the attitude of a beginner. Um, but the range of possibilities is vast. And there's, a, there's another thing Ajashanti talked about. There's, for some reason, a, a tendency to 
kind of latch on to, to some level of awakening and assume it's final. I don't know mm -hmm. why people do this, but it happens mm -hmm. a lot. I've seen mm -hmm. it a lot. And sometimes that awakening mm -hmm. is actually nothing more than an intellectual understanding. It's not mm -hmm. even the beginnings of an uh, experiential mm -hmm. awakening. People read a whole bunch of books, get the non-duality thing and going in their brain and think that, that they, they have realized it. Um, but, um, you know, it's far more than that. Um, mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, so um, uh, to me there's like, there's like two tracks. There's, there's the track of awakening that many people that you've interviewed describe as kind of up and out. Mm -hmm. they, uh, they, have that, they have that recognition and that becomes the folk, you know, their life. Their life is abiding in that. Mm -hmm. And that everything else uh, in terms of their relative lives is secondary. And there are different degrees of that among the different teachers that you've that you've recognized. Uh, and then there's um, then there's the school of experience mm -hmm. or teaching, where it's it's it becomes more down and in that you have a recognition of something which is absolute, which forms the basis of of identity, and that becomes is invited consciously into your life. Into your, into your personal interactions, and so much so that the recognition comes that it's, it's not different, that there's a, there's a marriage between absolute and relative, between human and divine. And this is, you could say, this is the point of reference that we have in waking down, that uh, we are divine as well as human. We're limited and we're free. We're bound and free, both together. And you can't find where one le leaves off and the other begins. And so it, it there's, different ways of coming at this experience and integrating it into our lives. So, and, and I think that's one of the beautiful things about uh, what you're doing is you're, you're exposing uh, many, many people to this whole range of, of possibilities and then their own being is going to select, you know, mm -hmm. vibrate with whatever, yeah. you know, path, whatever direction is right for them at that time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll put up an interview and I'll get emails from some people saying, oh, that guy was a bozo, you know, what, what a waste of my time. Other people saying, oh, that was the best one you've ever done. I love this guy. You know, yeah. I read all his books and stuff. Yeah. So you really, people just resonate with, right. with different things. Right. And these days, uh, embodiment is a real lively buzzword in the spiritual community. Yes. Um, right. There was this lady I interviewed about a month or two ago named Prajna Ginti. And <clears throat> she had done a number of spiritual things, practices, lived in, uh, she, she lived in Amrit Desai's ashram, she went to California, got into the satsang scene, spent time with Adyashanti, and she could sit in samadhi for hours on end, and she was really living a blissful life, everything was hunky-dory. And then she uh, got some, a really poor misdiagnosis by some doctors and was more or less forced to abort twins three months premature. And uh, her, they came out, you know, pound each, the size of her hands, and she ended up with an intense challenge, which, you know, just never let up. Uh, mm. so, so, you know, severe sleep deprivation and just dealing with the, this. They lived. They, they're both alive, and she's done an incredible job with these girls. It's, they'll be developmentally challenged for life, but she's done an incredible job. She got to the point at one point where she had one of them in her arms, and she was about to throw herself off a cliff. Mm -hmm. And something, she actually heard a voice, no, you cannot do that. And she was back on her butt on the ground. Wow. And, you know, she, she rose to the challenge. And, you know, now she feels like she wouldn't have changed a thing, and her, you know, She's come full cir circle in terms of her her bliss and her, uh, you know, mm -hmm. s stability of awareness, mm -hmm. but in a profoundly embodied way. Right. And you right. know, hopefully, most of us don't have to face such challenges. Um, well, that, that that is a kind of a theme that uh, I've heard many of the teachers interviewed, and, and it's in waking down also that that once there's an awakening, that uh, many unresolved issues from the past uh, tend to bubble up and perhaps because there's, there's a greater identity with, with being. Mar so, Marishi said, when the postman yeah. knows you're going to move, he tries to deliver all your mail. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it's, 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 uh, it's common yeah. that that happens, that, that uh, especially if there is going to be embodiment of this, 
of this being force, this identity into your into your life, which it seems the planet needs right now. It mm -hmm. needs people not to live in caves, although that's a value in and of itself. But for people to, to come into who they are as, as individuals, and in, in order to do that, you kind of have to become aware of the, yeah. all the patterning that prevents you from, from that. Well, you know, Christ's talked about not pouring new wine into old wineskins. Mm -hmm. And uh, maybe that's back to our discussion about preparing the physiology, and you really should get a new wineskin before you pour the wine in. But if you happen to pour the wine into an old one, it's really stretching the metaphor here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the the wineskin is going to start to change. You know, the wine's going to start changing it. Yes. Uh, and all kinds of things may have to be purged, psychological, yeah. physiological, uh, yeah. because all that shadow stuff, I don't think, can sustain the presence of, you know, awakened consciousness. Yes. Yeah. And maybe some of the stuff is really tenacious and it mm -hmm. will sustain it, mm -hmm. you know, it, it will kind of mm -hmm. cling on for a lifetime mm -hmm. or whatever. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But there's a tendency, I think, for it to start to blow out once or, the or, juice is flowing. Or at the, at the very least, uh, you become aware of the patterns yeah. that uh, are unconscious. And then becoming conscious. aware of them. You but the patterns may still, still be there, mm -hmm. but you're aware of them. And so they have less power over you and there's, there's less space, so to speak, that they're less energy is being tied up in them. Yeah, which, and maybe uh, they start to resolve. I interviewed Neelam last week and she was talking about meeting everything as it comes up and in this process of meeting everything as it comes up, it just, you know, layer by layer gets resolved and, and whatever is next to be resolved comes up and you meet it and then it gets resolved and, it, and there seems to be no end to it, but yeah. 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 Let's <laughs> see what else we got. How about uh, uh, I never asked you about your uh, personal uh, spiritual journey. We know about TM, but maybe before that even, how did you, uh, I mean, did you come from a religious family where uh, uh, devotion to God was forefront in your uh, My in father your had severe PTSD and was a raging alcoholic and epileptic, mixing phenobarbital and alcohol on a regular basis. You can imagine the results of that. Um, that took its toll on my mother, and she tried to commit suicide three times. And, uh, so, and we listened to all this as we were growing up as kids you yeah. know, in the 50s uh, and, uh, and early 60s. Uh. So that, that was my spiritual upbringing. Um, <laughs> uh, but they, at the very same time, I loved them both. And I feel like they were very intelligent, highly evolved people mm. who just had that, that, you know, mm. that hand dealt to them. Yes. And, yes. Um, you know, my father was incredibly creative and, and sensitive. He was a professional artist. Uh, my mother was a character, and some of you may have known her. Um, she was just, uh, you know, full of sort of innocent enthusiasm mm -hmm. about stuff. Mm -hmm. But uh, as far as my spiritual stuff is concerned, uh, the earliest thing I remember is when I was a kid and had a high fever with measles or whatever. We all got those diseases in those yeah. days. Uh, um, I remember sitting in bed. And uh, when I wasn't actually delirious, I remember sitting in bed and having this experience of simultaneous vastness and tininess, infinite weight and infinite lightness. And I would just sit there and be fascinated with it. There'd be like this incredible density and incredible you know, va uh, vacuum, mm. sort of void, mm. And, mm. and it just kept kind of fluctuating. And I just sat there and examined it for the longest time. In as I sat there, I might have been in ten years, yeah, ten years old or something, really ten young. Years old. Okay. Um, and then, you know, I also had experiences like we all had about staring at the stars at night, you know, and just mm. sort of thinking about the universe. And you know, mm. every every year on my birthday, I'd go to the Hayden Planetarium, and the next year I'd go mm. to the Natural History Museum. Next oh. year, Hayden Planetarium. Next <laughs> year, Natural History Museum. <laughs> Uh, so I was always curious and fascinated with things. Um, the spiritual thing didn't really kick in until I took LSD mm. when I was 17. And I, my, you know, it was a jaw-dropping experience in terms of realizing that, uh, it, that not everybody sees the world the same way. <laughs> <laughs> you know, <laughs> I, I went to, you know, at that morning, we'd been up all night, you know, tripping, and then went to a donut shop, Dunkin' Donuts, in the morning, and I was just looking at the donut selling <laughs> ladies and thinking, wow, they're seeing the world so much differently than I am right now. I, th I thought, that's it. Everything depends on how you see the world. Right. You know, it's your, it's your perspective. It's not the world. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's how you see the world. Yeah. I could never forget that. 
Um, so, yes, yes. You know, so I spent about a year muddling around, getting more and more screwed up, dropping out of high school, getting arrested a couple of times. And um, then finally one night I was sitting on my bed, tripping again, and, uh, <laughs> and I couldn't go to sleep. So it's like three in the morning and I'm, I'm, I'm sitting reading a, a Zen book, Zen Flesh, Zen Bones. And, uh, and it, it re something really hit me. I said, these guys are really serious. And I'm totally screwing around thinking that I'm you know, going to get enlightened or something. Mm -hmm. I said, okay, that's it. I'm going to stop taking drugs, I'm going to mm -hmm. learn transcendental meditation, and I'll see what happens. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that's what happened. So you've been meditating? Uh, Since summer of 68. Mm -hmm. Some, summer of 68, uh, and did you have any uh, vacations from uh, meditation? I never missed one. Never missed one? No. What, would what do you think would happen if you did? My head would explode. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. It's just like, I'm really good at routines. Uh, on, the, on the sixth uh, Humboldt course in 1971 or two, Phil Hirshhorn and Ira Clements gave a talk about the value of flossing your teeth. And I've flossed my teeth every darn day since I heard them say that, yes. you know, because if something is good, I'm just going to do it, you know, as a matter of routine. And if yes. I don't do it routinely, then, you know, skip one here, two there, ten there. Next thing you know, I'm not doing it. So I'm just going to stick th to this thing because, yes. anyway, I mean, geez, I, I was a high school dropout. I was completely messed up. Within a few weeks after I'd learned, I'd, you know, reconciled with my father who had thrown me out of the house. I'd gotten a job. I, I had made arrangements to, you know, get a GED diploma and get back into school. So it really turned me around. And, you know, yes. within two years, I was teaching the darn thing. Yes, <laughs> yes. So you, you've seen uh, an, evo an evolution over, this is like 40 years you've been meditating. Yeah, 46 or something. 46 years. Yeah. Uh, you've seen an evolution in your practice, or has it just become more like, uh, <coughs> you know, just so integrated into your life that you couldn't, you couldn't imagine uh, living without it? Um, I've like never had a meditation that didn't work in terms of actually settling down and, and having, having it be enjoyable and, you know, feeling better afterwards. Uh, but, you know, I wouldn't say that even now my meditation experiences are any more profound than they were 40 years ago. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but it's just a routine. But the, the effects in daily life have always been continued to yes. be cumulative yeah. for me yeah. And, yeah. and still are. Yeah. And, you know, now, um, you know, there's just this sort of steadiness of awareness mm -hmm. that is there no matter what, mm -hmm. um, whether I'm... And it's know, a way to pay honor to that steadiness of awareness yeah. by putting your attention on it a couple times a day. It's, it's, it's as if you're, uh, you're recognizing the value of that in your life. And, and you're, it's as if it's, it's almost a, a devotional practice. Yeah, it that. is. It's kind of like a CAT scan in a way, in, in yeah. the sense that I find myself, the, the awareness just sort of scans the body and notices things, and those things get resolved, and mm -hmm. you know, it just kind of goes on like mm -hmm. that. And the Buddha meditated his whole life after his awakening. Right. Uh, Ramana Maharshi went into a cave for about 16 or some 24 years or something after his awakening and mm -hmm. just meditated. So there are people who say, friends of mine even, say to me, you know, there will come a time when you're just going to drop it and, it, and the fact that you're still doing it indicates that you haven't arrived or, or whatever, and they may be right, for all I know. Mm -hmm. um, maybe I'll drop it at some point, mm -hmm. but I just feel no inclination to do so. My experience is that it's an individual consideration, whether yeah. people continue with practices or don't continue with mm -hmm. practices, that it, it, it doesn't have anything to do with, you know, the depth of the quality of their recognition or their realization. It has more to do with who they are as a person and what they enjoy doing with their lives. Yeah. And, uh, and I do it a lot. I mean, I spend yeah. probably three hours a day. Mm -hmm. You know, I get up at four in the morning, meditate an hour, go to sleep again for a while, get up mm -hmm. again, do my bathroom stuff, meditate an hour, mm -hmm. do it in the afternoon, do it before mm -hmm. bed. You know, so, so I really enjoy it. It's just a routine that works for me. Have nourish, you feel nourished yeah. for it. And, you know, I'm oh. not good at forcing myself to do things I don't want to do uh, or that are really Mm. unpleasant or, or mm -hmm. you know so it's just a it, it's self-reinforcing yeah you know yes. but as you say I mean I would never tell anybody they should or shouldn't do that or anything mm -hmm. I mean somebody comes to me and saying they're, they're getting great benefits out of chanting Hare Krishna or being a fundamentalist Christian or whatever I would say great you know go for it mm -hmm. do it you know mm -hmm. enjoy I, I really feel like everybody is kind of on the path they're meant to be on 
-hmm. And if that path doesn't work for them anymore for some reason, they'll switch paths and do something yeah, else. And the, <laughs> your work is helping people to uh, make those choices yeah. in the world yeah. by giving them, and this is unprecedented, giving them the knowledge of, all, of a variety of people. Uh, it, it started off with like just regular Joes, mm -hmm. but now it's, it's, I would say that most of the people that you're interviewing are, are, have websites and, you know, and, yeah. and they're teachers. Yeah, but they're regular Joes too, you know? Right. We're all bozos on this bus. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> and, you know, we all perform the same bodily functions and so on. So just because somebody's yeah. well known or, you know, something like that. Well, getting back to your spiritual yeah. history, uh -huh. I mean, is there anything else other than, than TM that you've, you've done on your spiritual path or quest? Uh, I, strictly speaking, I don't do TM anymore because I'm, I'm using a mantra that Amma gave me. I've been doing that for about a decade. Amma. Yeah. yeah okay. the, you know, everyone knows who Amma is, the hugging saint. Mm -hmm. And so the TM movement would say I don't do TM. Mm -hmm. um, I do it TM style. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, I do my asanas, you know, most days, right. you know, things like so that. So there's a, there's a devotional component in your relationship with Amma. Yeah. But, you know, it's different than it used to be with Maharishi in the sense that, with, and that's because I think I feel fulfilled now. Whereas with Maharishi, there was this sort of yearning, craving yes. kind of, oh, you know, yes. all the time. And I had to be around him and I had to go to yeah. this course and do that. Right. Now it's like, I go to see Amma, leave Amma, mm -hmm. whatever, and there's this continuum yes. of fulfillment. Yes. Well, that's, that's, in a sense, um, <coughs> devotion isn't something you do, it, it's something you can't help but do. Yeah. It's as if you're called to it. It's, there's, some, there's, some, there's some transmission that uh, resonated with you that, that brought you to her. Yeah. In the same way that your, uh, your interviews with people, there's a transmission quality there because it's alive. It's not just, in, a, and mm. in some case, I'm sure from reading the letters, that people pick up on different transmissions and, and it's transformative. And I do too. I mean, this, talk about the spiritual practices, doing these interviews. Yeah, that's, that's Yeah, I question. really get zapped. Um, you know, whether they're in person or over Skype, I really feel, I feel so elated. Some, sometimes I come out from doing an interview and my cheeks are all rosy and I, I, Irene says, wow, it looks like you've been jogging or something. Yes, yes. It just like wakes up the life yeah. in me. Well, wasn't, uh, didn't Maharishi talk about uh, association with the wise yeah. as, a, the as, a means, as a means of developing mm -hmm. uh, recognition? Yeah. And also in preparation for these things, I listened to probably at least an hour a day of people's inter other interviews right. and talks mm -hmm. and read their books. And so I've, you know, all my spare time, I've got my attention on this. You know, I put my yes. iPod on when yes. I wake up in the morning yeah. and then start brushing my teeth, right. listening to something. Um, maybe plus I meditating should, three hours a day. <laughs> so that's my spiritual yes. practice for what it's worth. It yeah. works for me. Right. Um, but this has been a real evolutionary thing for me. And, and it's also been really cool to get to know so many wonderful people. I mean, to have these conversations with these people every week, uh, they're all so delightful and interesting. And it's, it's just so enriching to, to have these conversations with them. And some of them have become very dear friends, mm. you know, like mm. Francis Bennett, for instance, yes. who, who's like a brother to me now. He's coming here in two weeks, by the way, uh, to teach a retreat. And um, Igor Kufayev, the, mm -hmm. the Russian fellow, uh, we, we're, we feel like this sort of brotherly connection. Right. And um, Well, that's what I mean. Yeah. In the same way that you've created a relationship with them, this, uh, I'm sure that, that others that are hearing your, pod, your, your broadcasts are creating relationships of, of their own. Yeah, yeah they are, the, 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 all these people. And the, the people I interview usually say uh, that they're really surprised by the response, you know, that um, they get sort of a huge wave of interest, of inquiries. And the bat gap bump. The bat gap bump, yeah. Um, <laughs> so, and it's really, you know, when I was on my six month course, towards the end of the six month course, I was in Biarritz and I was made the course director or something like this is that. It's a TM course. TM, yeah, mm -hmm. TM long six month meditation course. And I was made the course director and it kind of went to my head. I thought that I deserved a better room and maybe better food, and uh, I started getting kind of bossy with people, and, and so. And this kind of this came to Marshy's attention, and I got the message back: "You're just a connector and a collector." 
<laughs> you know? And that, I really took that to heart. I, I kind of feel like that's what I'm doing with this thing. I'm, a, I, I'm connecting and mm -hmm. collecting. Yes. And it, I, I really get a lot of joy out of connecting people whom I feel deserve a oh, broader stage, a bigger audience, yes. with yes. that audience. Right, um, right. You know, it's, and it's really gratifying to hear these stories, like this guy from Australia, you know, mm -hmm. saved my life or whatever. Uh, and the reverence that people have in their voices, you know, it's this... Rick Morris. That, <laughs> that makes me uncomfortable. See, do, you see, do you see Rick? I go, well, I try to get an appointment. <laughs> no, that, that really makes me uncomfortable. As a matter of fact, uh, Kristen Kirk, who's also coming here in two weeks, um, I'll explain a little bit later what Francis and Kristen are going to be doing here. Uh, she just did a retreat in Hawaii, and some of the people on that retreat in Hawaii wouldn't have been there if not for her interview with me. And they decided that they felt inspired to make these little testimonial videos that I could put up on Batgap. Mm -hmm. uh, but they're all these sort of mushy, gushy, Rick, you're so wonderful stuff. And I thought, no, oh, yeah, I can't. It, it, yeah. just, it just makes me squirm, yeah. you know? Yeah. <laughs> and fortunately, I, I have a very down-to-earth wife who you know, <laughs> <laughs> doesn't, like, you know, give me an inch of that kind yes, of uh, yes, latitude. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> so right. it's really not about me. Right. And there really is, you know, it sounds kind of like a cliche, but I really feel like I'm not doing this, you know, mm -hmm. and I'm not doing anything. It's sort of mm -hmm. like I'm just kind of rolling along it's not even mm -hmm. me rolling along. There's a sense, in a very real sense, nothing is happening, you mm -hmm. know? And I'm not doing anything. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. But I'm just kind of, well, to quote Suzanne Siegel again, doing the next obvious thing, mm -hmm. following each impulse as it comes up. And one idea leads to the next, and it just kind of unfolds. That's kind of like being in your dharma. Yeah, in it's my a, dharma. And I, I sort of feel like I'm s kind of a tool. It would, mm -hmm. it, that reminds me of another thing, which is that, you know, for years and years and years, I, I felt like I want to get enlightened before I die, you know? Yes. There was this intensity about getting enlightened. Now I never have that feeling or that thought. Now it's more like, if there's any intensity, it's more like, of what value can I be as, yes. as long as I'm in this body? How, how, yes. how can I contribute yes. in some way? And right. so this, is, this really means a lot to me to be able to do this because I feel like I'm having some kind of yes. impact. Right. and serving in some way, right. you know, benefiting. Well, that is, that is uh, in my definition, that is what embodiment is. That's, that is that, that beingness that you are wanting to come through you into the world to see itself and know itself and be itself. <clears throat> and, it's, and, and, I, and, I, and there's like both tendencies. There's, there's the desire to, to go up and out and to know ourselves as, as that. And then it's the, the desire of that, which is ultimately living us anyway. Yeah. It's the desire of that, of that to incarnate more and more and more into matter, <clears throat> to know itself as matter. Yeah. And so there's, it's, to me, it, one is the foundation for the other. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's just beautiful to hear and to see all of the people that you're, you're, that you're bringing forward that are doing that in their lives, that have had spiritual recognition and, and they're not just running for the caves to, to culture that, although some people, that's their tendency. Mm -hmm. But what they're doing is they're, they're bringing it forward into the world in their own way. Yeah. yeah. There's that saying, which I'm sure you've all heard, that the next Buddha is the Sangha. Yes. Um, you know, and this, the way it seems to be going now, and modern technology has facilitated this, is that, you know, rather than some guy in sandals being able to walk around, a, you know, 30 mile radius in the course of a lifetime or something, yes. um, this stuff is just spreading all over the world at yes. the speed of light. Yeah. And, um, and so, you know, what was it? George H.W. Bush who talked about the thousand points of light yes. all the time. <laughs> well, what he meant by that. But it seems like all over the world there's just this sort of enlivenment taking place and uh, awakenings taking place spontaneously. I was listening to Jetta Mali the other day. And People's she, friends are helping them to wake up. Yeah. Which is kind of the work that we do. It's, yeah. it's, it's your friends, you know, working together, you know, in, for that purpose, mm -hmm. to help each other. There's yeah. this lady I'm going to interview this weekend named Jetta Mali, and uh, I was listening to her stuff, and she, was, she made the comment that each time somebody awakens, it becomes mm. that much easier for other people to awaken. Mm. It's, it's like 
we're kind of like making the membrane that, that blocks us from awakening yes. thinner and thinner with, yes. e with each new awakening. Yes. Hundredth monkey kind of idea. Uh, well, that's what you were saying at the beginning. The, the, one of the first things we said is that, okay, this is, you wanted to bring this out to Fairfield because you saw the disconnect. Yeah. And if, if people start talking about recognitions that they've had, then that gives other people the, the confidence, hey, if, if that bozo is awakened and he seems confident about it, yeah, maybe there's, maybe hope, there's for hope for me. Maybe there's hope for me. Yeah, that kind of thing. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was my signal. <laughs> okay. If if you were me, what would you ask yourself right now? <laughs> I was going to say uh What was the, the biggest surprise that you, in, in, in the people that you've, were there any surprises, things that like people said that you could not, and you were like, you know, bleh, 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 I have no idea what's going on here. Uh, or perhaps in yeah, a good way, in a, a good way. A couple of thoughts on that, I guess. Um, one thing I do is, you know, while I'm interviewing the person, I'm, I'm sitting there and, you know, I feel like if, the, if my mind were, the more settled my mind is, the better I would be at this. Mm -hmm. And it's not as settled as it could be. You know, there's always yes, some yes. kind of buzz going on. Right. Um, and, but I sit there and just allow myself to be as settled as possible and uh, be, as, be attentive to what comes up. And as the person talks, um, you know, uh, questions are, are kind of triggered or yes. elicited, yes. and they they bubble, and they you know I let them talk, and the the questions kind of rearrange themselves in my mind as the person is talking. Like, okay, you're at the front of the line. Oh, they just said that. You move back, and this one's yeah. up in the front yeah. now. Um, and then when when it's time for me to ask a question, um, you know, there's a sense of there's an impulse of which one to ask. Yes. And people often say that. I ask just the thing that they were wanting to ask, you know, they, yeah. they, they think that. So, um, but sometimes it's hard to understand what a person is actually trying to say. Yes. This happens once in a while, and, and so I end up trying to, re I, I kind of try to restate what they just said to make sure I got it right. Mm -hmm. um, but, so I don't know if that answers your question, but that's part of yeah, the process. Um, Larry King once uh, was asked what his most difficult interview was, and, and he said it was Marlon Brando. And, and uh, he said, well, why was that? He said, because he really wouldn't talk. I mean, I, I would ask him a question, and he would say yes, <laughs> and sit there. Uh, I'd have to come up with another question. So there was one guy whom I interviewed, I don't remember his name, um, and I, I kind of expected him to be like everybody else, which is you know, fairly loquacious. I could just, you know, tr he would get talking, I'd throw in a question every now and then, but it was like, boom, flat. I couldn't get him to, t to say anything. Yeah. And I, I was thinking, why did this guy want to be interviewed? And as it turned out, after the whole thing was over, he and I both decided not to put it up. Uh, yeah, yeah. It, it was just, just didn't flow. Yeah, it didn't flow. Yeah. But most, 99% of them flow. And, um, they flow, sometimes they've flowed for three whole hours, and the, the shortest one has still been over an hour. Um, and mm -hmm. usually after a certain point, hour and a half, two hours, I just kind of get this feeling like, all right, we're done. Mm -hmm. and, and then we move yes. toward wrapping it up. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm starting to get that feeling for myself. <laughs> no, we're not done yet. But, no, 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 we're not done yet, but I, I was thinking that might, we have a half an hour or so, it might be, might be good to have some people from the audience. Sure, uh, yeah. That can always... Do, do we have to actually get out of here at a certain time? Or no. Uh, no, no, we can okay. keep going. Um, no, they'll just be off. Unless they want, if you want to be on mic, come and stand up here, otherwise just, I mean on a camera, otherwise just be there. Make sure you turn it on. Okay. So Rick, having interviewed lots of people, so 230 people. I'm wondering if over this time you've seen uh, common, oh, we'll wait for the sound, huh? Can you hear me now? Okay. So I'm wondering if over this 230 interviews you've seen common themes, common characters, common things arise uh -huh. that might in some way define spiritual maturity. That's a good question. Um, well, part of it, I think, Part of it, I think, is this embodiment thing. 
Yeah, and, and that thing I said earlier about people who just have an intellectual concept of, of non-duality or something and think that's it, that would be the sort of low end of the scale. Uh, then, you know, if we could kind of make a scale. Then there are people who have in the up and out stage Mm -hmm. And then there are people who are much more embodied. Um, and interestingly, I'm also noticing something that I think conforms to Marshi's seven states model, which is that I'm noticing uh, in certain teachers whom I would consider sort of more mature in their spirituality, uh, a real blossoming of the heart. Yes. And, um, yes. mm -hmm. like Adyashanti, for instance, yes. again, um, yes. you know, has you know recently been talking a lot about Jesus and understanding the teachings of Jesus, and you know, and there's just a, this devotional component that seems to be dawning in the way some people teach. And also, I mean, you're, you're all f people here are all familiar with Marshi's seven states model: cosmic consciousness, God consciousness, unity consciousness. People on the internet may not be, but the the, the second one, I, the first one I just mentioned, cosmic consciousness, was supposed to be pure awareness maintained all the time, no matter what, and it's and the, including during deep sleep. And it's interesting to I, I, I often ask that question to people: what happens when you sleep? And there are a number of people who maintain pure awareness as clear as a bell throughout sleep. Um, and some don't, but I'm not totally convinced that that has to be a, an absolute criterion. I don't know. Uh, and some people say, well, I did for a while, and now I just as soon snore. You know, <laughs> I, 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 I prefer being out like a light, so I'm not qualified to say. But the next one was God consciousness that he talked about, which is refined perception. And uh, this kind of fascinates me, because mm -hmm. if you think about it, the the iconography of just about every spiritual tradition and the literature, you know, depicts subtle perception. Halos, angels, uh, you know, devas, demons, I mean, all kinds of stuff that's supposed to exist on some level or other that we ordinarily don't perceive. Mm -hmm. And so if all the spiritual traditions talk about that stuff, um, shouldn't it begin to dawn in the experience of these people who say they have had a spiritual awakening. And mm -hmm. I'm finding in more and more cases that it, it, it is, it does. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, it fascinates me so much that uh, I decided to form a little, to, to set up a little forum where people who have this, who have sort of what I would call stabilized subtle perception, stabilized, refined, or celestial perception can talk about this whole topic and we'll put mm -hmm. it up on BatGap and mm -hmm. we're going to do that um, when Francis Bennett comes mm -hmm. in a couple of weeks because he's one such person. Um, in fact, I had already become really good friends with him and knew him quite well and uh, he hadn't mentioned this at all and mm -hmm. uh, we were just going to the airport to come back from California after the Science and Non-Duality Conference and he, he mentioned to me that he sees subtle beings all the time. They're always sort of attending to people and helping them in certain ways and, and doing all this stuff. And I, I was so fascinated with it. I kept asking him questions. Like, Are they here? Do you see any now? We were like in, a, we were in an elevator in the, in the San Francisco <laughs> airport. <laughs> and I, I said, are there any in the elevator? <laughs> and uh, he just kind of smiled. And then he, uh, when we got off the elevator, he said, oop. He said, they just told me, don't point us out to people. If they're meant to see us, they'll see us. Um, and then, it, then he said, well, there were three. Uh, <laughs> but, pardon? Then he said, well, there were three <laughs> in the elevator. It was a small elevator, too. Um, so, sorry, Francis, I didn't mean to embarrass you, but he's been very reluctant to talk about this because it's sort of like a, a sensitive, subtle thing that is intimate, yeah. And, he's, and, and so this is actually going to be one of the things we're going to talk about in this forum is, well, should we really be talking about this? Um, or be, but it's like, it seems to me that it's kind of one of those things that is, you know, if we lived in a society where everybody had refined perception, it would be like, yeah, duh, so what? You know, it would be, it would be matter of fact. Yes. Normal. And so if some people are starting to experience it, then they're kind of the, um, what's that word, the, the advanced avant-garde. They're, they're kind of mm -hmm. out on the fringes beginning to have this experience. And maybe 20 years from now, the spiritual community at large, this will be kind of where non-dual realization is today. Uh, so, so Francis will be there, um, Kristen Kirk, 
who has very, been much more open about this, uh, Rufina Farouk Anklazaria. Some of you may ref remember Farouk Anklazaria, who has been teaching TM in prisons in the St. Louis area, although they don't call it TM for legal reasons. Uh, but she's you know, very profound experiences in this way. And um, Harry Alto, mm -hmm. who is very squeamish about doing anything like this in public. Mm -hmm. It took me four years to talk him into mm -hmm. being interviewed. And his experience of the subtle mechanics of creation is off the charts. Um, but perhaps because he's been awakened since his, his childhood <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, and has had time to develop. But anyway, this, it's, that's kind of a fun thing about Back Up too, is it's like a, in a way it's like a play toy where if something interests me, I can talk about it uh, with, with people who are having that kind of experience and it's, it's just so much fun. Like I'm really interested in um, the kind of materialistic mindset that forms the basis of our culture, primarily the scientific and the and technological culture that has such a profound impact on our world. And you know, the mindset is basically that this is dead matter uh, and we can pretty much do whatever we want with it, uh, as, you know, to reap whatever rewards we can get from it mm -hmm. and so on. And uh, I think that if we, as a culture, um, appreciated the, the, in, the innate divinity in every particle of creation, then we would treat it much more respectfully. Yeah. Um, so I'm, I'm kind of working on getting really familiar with Sam Harris. Yes. In order to interview him at some point, I'm going to read all his books and listen to everything wonderful. I can, just to stretch my own boundaries and just to sort of kind of discuss another area which I think is really fascinating and really important. Right. Thank you. I I had a. When you're talking about uh, God consciousness or su subtle perception, um, I, I thought I, it can come in the form of, of, of seeing, mm -hmm. uh, visual, and feeling these these uh, subtle layers of creation, mm -hmm. but it can also show up in in a very seemingly ordinary way, where there is a flow of love, uh, mm -hmm. which to me is the subtlest form of creation. There's a flow of love that, that spontaneously connects you with the other person. Yeah. Not just on the level of consciousness, but viscerally as a human being. There's a, uh, a connectivity that, that's it's poignant. Mm. It, it's, it's, it's both, it's both bl beautiful or blissful, but it's, it's painful it also. Mm. It, and, and it's a combination of both. And, and to me, that's, that's indicative of the descent of, you could say, the Christ into matter is that, that Christ love that, that connects us with, you know, the world that we live in and the people in the world and the, and the trees and the critters and, uh, and all of that. And yeah. So uh, it's both. The, the, when, I think when Maharishi talks about God consciousness, he's, he's talking about both, both of that. And he's, he actually talked about, I've been listening to some of his talks on it recently because I'm gearing up for this topic, but, yes. you know, he talks about how it's love or appreciation, yes. kind of to a superlative degree, appreciation to a superlative degree would be love, which refines the perception. Yes. And which cultures the nervous system to be able to maintain refined perception. Um, and as the song says, mm. that's what the world needs now. Yeah? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Another question? The mic is in the chair. Anybody wants to ask a question? <clears throat> uh, Carol, but come on the mic. <clears throat> you won't be on camera, you just, and then f make sure it's flicked on before you start talking. Go ahead. Is it on? Yeah. Good. Is it on? It's on. Okay. Have you ever ha interviewed somebody who you thought was like really hokey and hooey and, you know, <laughs> and not real, not really, you know, present in that way? And yeah, a couple. How do you deal with that? Um, I try to I, I try to be um, respectful. I'm not going to be insulting to people, mm -hmm. but um, I try to be a little bit challenging also in terms of, you know, whether they're actually experiencing what they say they are, uh, or whether it's just conceptual. And um, there have been a couple like that. Um, and 
the, this whole thing of scheduling people is one of the most difficult things because there are well over a thousand people on the waiting list, and um, new requ new requests come in every day. I can only do one a week. I still have a job. Uh, <laughs> You're going to be busy for a long time. I will. I'll be doing this well into my 90s, just with the people that on on the list. And so, you know, I I feel bad because. I know that there are a lot of those thousand people would be really interesting to talk to, and I would like to talk to them all right away. Uh, but I somehow have to prioritize. And in the past, I was shooting from the hip a lot more, just sort of, all right, let's schedule this guy and see what happens. These days, Irene is taken over the scheduling and she actually watches YouTube videos and tries to get a, a feel for the person uh, and so you know we have a voting system also where uh, people submit these requests through a form on the website and people with a lot of votes tend to either in a spreadsheet they tend to rise to the top of the spreadsheet but we don't strictly go by that either um, because sometimes it's the people you've never even heard of that are like Francis Bennett who just come out of a monastery who are, who are going to be really interesting so it's a it's a inexact kind of clumsy method uh, you know, and but I do my best with that, and you know I kind of feel bad about having to put people off sometimes who who've requested interviews. Um, anyway, that's my answer to that question. Uh, she had a question. <clears throat> um, I'm a little confused about. Um, someone had mentioned that you still feel stress and you had mentioned some things that um, make me confused about um, it, Jesus did say that by your by their fruits you shall know them and I wonder what I know you're probably not very judgmental you don't seem like the person you'd say no that person's not enlightened or that person is enlightened but what kind of fruits do you see from these people who you get a sense really are awakened um, I, I really, I'm not so much a believer in enlightenment as I am in the outcome. That's and a very good question. That's, that's something my wife always says too, that you know, she really wants to see some kind of tangible evidence that someone has ta attained something of, of significance, otherwise it's not significant to her, in her estimation. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, as you were saying earlier, we all have our dharmas. Um, some people are just Bernadette Roberts. I mean, she, I don't know a whole lot about her. I haven't read her books yet, but she's one of these famous, you know, spiritual writers. But, you know, mainly she left the convent after having had a profound spiritual awakening and raised a family. And that was where most of her energy was going, raising this family, at the same time having profound spiritual experiences. So perhaps her neighbors didn't even know that anything was going on. She, maybe she was a good mother, I don't know. Uh, so it doesn't necessarily mean one is going to be out being a Mother Teresa or something, if you've had a spiritual awakening, because we do all have our talents and our dharma. Our dharma just means that kind of course of action which is most in tune with our particular makeup and most conducive to our evolution. Um, <clears throat> I, a lot of the people I interview happen to be teachers because that's how I know about them. If uh, and so their dharma seems to be teaching, and that they feel that that's how they're serving. Um, and that's great, but you know, I, yes, I was just going to say, you wake up as you are. Uh -huh. It's it's more of a remembering. It's a remembering something that's already there right now. It's it's a, it's it's not that your mind remembers it. It's the self remembers itself. It knows itself, and so externally, there cannot be any change. It's just you wake up as you are with all the baggage that you're coming into it, which you, that you have right now, and, and as a result of that, it's like a seismic you know, earthquake to your identity when that happens. And what can shake out out of that is, you know, all of the, the aspects of your being that have been held back for one reason or another will start to blossom. And it can take a while for that to happen as these things bubble up to be seen, felt, integrated, spoken, lived. So it's, it's, it's not that you, that all of a sudden there's a red cape and you turn into a, you know, a superman or a holy person. Uh, my sense of it is that you just become yourself more fully mm. and completely in the world and in your relationship with the world deepens 
as, as that beingness that you recognize yourself to be falls into your heart. You know, in the Indian tradition, well, also the Christian tradition and perhaps others, uh, service is considered a spiritual practice. In, in the Indian tradition, they call it seva, which usually means, is translated as selfless service. And it's considered a spiritual practice because it, it, it attenuates the ego. It is, if it, it, instead of it being all about what can I get for me, it's what can I do for this person. Mother Teresa spoke that way too. She saw everyone as Jesus and you know, what can I, how can I serve Jesus by serving this person and this person. Um, so it really does, and Amma is really big on that. And, um, I mean, she has people going out and, and cleaning up garbage in the streets of Calcutta or other, other cities around India, and she herself joins in for hours after having sat on her couch hugging people for 12, 14, 18 hours. She gets up and they clean garbage in the middle of the night and perhaps set an example for the, other, the townspeople to do it themselves in the future. And of course, hospitals and schools and orphanages and you know, support for widows and farmer suicide prevention and all these different things and that, that most of the energy that and she, I'm just using her as a case in point because I'm more familiar with her most of the energy that all the people around her are expending it has to do with helping other people and it, there's very little talk about oh I attained this state of enlightenment or that state of experience and usually when somebody wants to get into that kind of talk Amma deflects it and, and it's, it's more about helping others and, and she actually said at some point that you know if uh, well, we were talking earlier about culturing the capacity or the ability or the readiness for awakening that after enough service is performed, um, even a little meditation or other type of spiritual practice or perhaps nothing at all will result in, in awakening. And Shankara talked about this too. He talked about levels of uh, or st stages of um, preparedness for full realization. He said, for most people, Vedanta is inappropriate. They're not ready for it. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, service would be valuable for most people in a certain stage meditation, a certain stage self-inquiry, and so on. Raman Maharshi said a very similar thing. <clears throat> so I would flip it. I, w I would say that uh, all, what, which is, what is also true is that there may be no desire for service until this awakening happens. Yeah. And then as a result of that awakening, because something that you were just saying, uh, after all this meditation, you've lost the desire to get somewhere else. Yeah. You've lost the desire to pile up points, so to mm -hmm. speak. It's not a linear thing anymore. And, and it's the same way. I mean, a lot of, some services, okay, I, I'm serving so that ultimately this is going to benefit me. Yeah, it could be that way. Yeah. Whereas, if you're coming from a position of, of self-recognition, then it's just a natural out, 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 mm -hmm. outcome. Out, pouring of that yeah. into life because you feel the connection. You know the 23rd Psalm, my cup runneth over. So if the cup's not full, the orientation is going to be, hey, leave me alone. I'm busy filling my cup, you know. But yeah. once the cup is full and it starts to spill over, yeah. then there's just That's this spontaneous enough. giving. It's a great question. Yeah. yeah. Bobby, did you have a question? <clears throat> Uh, when, you, when you're interviewing people uh, or when you're kind of categorizing, do you have a concern about um, the distinctions between um, someone's experience? I mean, you know, an experience could be lights or an experience could be LSD. Uh, so an experience in contrast to someone being a teacher in contrast to someone who you would consider more of being a master in that uh, they sort of understand the steps and how to lead a person on? Or is it all just you know, a mishmash? It's a mishmash. There's been a whole potpourri of different types of people. Uh, you know, some of them are really, uh, they just have an experience and they can describe it. But they can't necessarily help anyone else get to it unless their description is conducive to somebody else's awakening. Other people have devised various kinds of techniques and practices and meditations and whatnot that people can do. Um, other people, they don't advocate techniques so much, but they have such a powerful transmission that just being in their presence really helps people awaken. Um, so that, there seems to be, a, you know, people have all kinds of different talents and influences 
on, on others. Not everyone is cut out to be a teacher. Not, it's not everyone's dharma to do that. David? Can you just talk more about awakening? What is the definition of awakening? That's a good question, really, because if we're going to use words, yeah, we better agree on their meanings, or else we're all, you know, it's a Tower of Babel kind of thing. We're just all speaking different languages. Um, I think Fax gave a pretty good definition of it earlier on. Um, <laughs> remember that? I don't quite remember how I <laughs> phrased it. Uh, I would, I, to me, it's it's uh, it's an expansion of identity. It's a surprised expansion of identity to something that's already that's already there. It just it sort of owns itself, and it's it's fundamental. It's uh, it, the difference between an awakening and an experience is that with an awakening, uh, you can read the same book that you read you know the day before and, and understand it completely differently because there's something fundamental in the way that uh, you identify that changes. It's a, it's, it's a fundamental shift in who you are in, in the acceptance or the recognition of who you are as consciousness and, and it doesn't end there. There are awakenings of that that, that progress in my experience. That, For sure. It, uh, that um, there's, a, there's an awakening into, into your life and into, into having that descend or fall into your heart, into your life, into, into the world. <clears throat> and so I think fundamental is a good way to uh, encapsulate it. Also, if you think about it, the vast majority of people in the world uh, identify very strongly and deeply with what we would call their individuality. You ask them who they are, mm -hmm. and they'll give you their name. No, that's just your name. Well. This, I, this is me. Well, that's just your body. Well, this is my job. This is my wife. This, you know, they, they describe various sort of external features, and there's no sort of inkling of any kind of pure consciousness or deep fundamental reality that as their true identity. They, they're kind of flesh-bound you know, in, a, in a small package. Uh, whereas, you know, we all have heard, we all have the understanding that the quote-unquote enlightened person, their primary identification is as the ultimate reality itself, as consciousness, as the, the ground of being. Uh, so the identity has kind of shifted 180 degrees. And <clears throat> there's still, you know, Marshi always used the term Lesha Vidya, there's still going to be some faint remains at least of um, and perhaps not so faint, of, of individual uh, identification. Otherwise, you wouldn't be able to function. You wouldn't be able to feed yourself. You'd be I think he's pushed around on a people gurney. People living in caves and stuff. I mean, my relationship with is huge. <laughs> yeah, but as you just said, he said his Laisha Vidya is huge. It's not Laisha. It's, it's Mucho Vidya. Mucho Vidya. <laughs> But again, there's a vast range of possibilities. And, you know, for all I know, we all may be spiritual neophytes compared to what's really ultimately in store for us mm -hmm. at some stage of the game. I don't know. Yes. Um, I, I was thinking, Jesus, Fax is going to ask me if I'm enlightened. And, and, I, and I was thinking, if, if he asked me that, what I would say would be, uh, if you really want to you know, cheapen the term, yeah, fine. But, <laughs> but, but um, you know, I really, and it's not some kind of false modesty thing or something. I, I really feel like the, the, the range of possibility, I mean, in the Indian tradition, they, have, they talk of 16 kalas, which are supposed to be like levels of possible evolution. And human beings are said to occupy something like the fourth through the eighth kala. So that, you know, if, if that's a true model, then the most enlightened person who ever walked the earth was in the eighth kala, and there are many above that. So, you know, who knows what possibilities there may be. It's, it's Never me, ends. Yeah. Endless awakenings. <clears throat> Stan. Hi, Rick. Hi. Um, this young lady over here asked us about know them by their works. Mm -hmm. And probably you'll recall Maharishi talked many, many times about humans being born not to work for another person, but to command nature and to command the laws of nature. Mm -hmm. And we don't really see a way to 
evaluate that easily socially. It's kind of a personal experience. <clears throat> and I've spent the last seven years here doing research on people that have reported awakening experiences with profound supportive nature support. Mm -hmm. And uh, trying to analyze to see on um, an uh, academic level if we can actually determine w how that process occurs after the person becomes awake in self-referral. <clears throat> and I think finally, just about three weeks ago, I had my data sort of crystallize into some meaningful you know, ways that I can express it and converse about it. Huh? And there is a very, very clear evolution of the entire nervous system from self-awareness through six levels of mind. And, and each one of those levels has to be cultured to completely replace the ego with self, the emotions with self, and, and eventually the entire world becomes nothing but an expression of self. Uh -huh. Everything that's seen and feel, <coughs> felt and, and, uh, and thought about. And, and, it, and then that process spontaneously and effortlessly and without any determination or predetermination results in the <coughs> subtlest fulfillment of any desire in an almost instantaneous way. Mm. So I think maybe that relates a little bit to this question, and it would be fun sometime in the future for you and I to talk about that. Yeah, we'll have to do that. Stan was one of the first people I interviewed on Bat Gap. If those who are watching on the internet can find him on there, Stan Kenz, K-E-N-Z. Um, so that's a good question. I guess I have a follow-up uh, to what I asked before. Uh, I guess. Uh, many of us, when we were on courses with Marishi, and um, there would be a discussion of experience with him, um, uh, we would have the benefit of him clarifying things, and in that sense, authenticating, well, helping to authenticate a person's experience. And so, uh, one of my concerns with um, Bat Gap is just that issue of you have this sort of wide range of experiences and yet for, uh, for the neophyte or for the new person uh, without having someone to help authentic authenticate, uh, it could be quite confusing. Yeah, and I'm certainly not qualified to verify or authenticate anybody and I don't, oh, and I, I don't try to do that, <clears throat> but you know it's it is what it is. It's sort of like people just kind of have to sort it out and go with what resonates with them. And I don't, uh, I don't think anybody I've interviewed is like, or anybody I've ever met in my life is like the ultimate final authority on everything. Uh, we're, we're all sort of, even, even and we've all met some great saints in our lives, uh, everybody in this room. Um, but I think it's important, Buddha said something, he said, he's, I can only roughly paraphrase, but he said, never kind of take my word for anything. Um, you know, just, you have to verify it in your own experience. So no matter who says anything, even if I've said it, Buddha said, uh, you know, you have to sort of go by your own, your own integrity, your own insight. Um, and you trust in your own being. Yeah. To, uh, so I think it's really, and that was for me one of the values of um, sort of involuntarily getting distanced from the TM movement. Um, you know, it, it was a, something I came to appreciate, and I, I still have great respect and appreciation for the, the TM movement, but I also appreciate having kind of been kicked out of the incubator because uh, it enabled me to kind of step back and reevaluate a lot of assumptions that I had taken for granted and that had gotten deeply ingrained. And it kind of came around eventually to just sort of, you know, there's that line by the band and that song of the night, they drove old Dixie down. You take what you need and you leave the rest. Um, and you're going to find perhaps a lot of what you need in a certain thing and a little of what you need in this thing. Uh, but you have to learn to kind of use your own discrimination. <clears throat> and I think it's unhealthy to ever assume that anybody is speaking the ultimate gospel truth. And even if they were, it's going to be filtered through your own interpretation. And so you, you still have to sort of take it with a grain of salt and see if it really sits right with you. you 
You can stay up here. <laughs> <laughs> another, another way of saying that is taking responsibility for your own awakening. Yeah. And we've seen examples of people in various, you know, from with gurus, with Christian things, and, you know, I mean, that the Heaven's Gate cult, they all killed themselves because some teacher told them that some spaceship was following the hale Bop comet and they would all elevate to some other level or something. So people have, and, and they did. maybe they did, Who, who's to say? Uh, and, you know, how many, how many hundreds of millions of people have been killed by others in this world because they happen to believe what it said in some book or they, they had some kind of rigid interpretation of the book or something and it, it clashed with every, you know, they felt like everybody else would be better off. Not to mention the paradoxical nature of spiritual awakening with, with, that we've talked about. I mean, you can look at pretty much any spiritual teacher and, and they say one thing at one time and they say the opposite. Yeah. And so you have, you have both going on. I think sometimes and, that's intentional. And a lot of times they're both right. Yeah. yeah. That's an important point, too. I mean, two completely paradoxically opposed statements can both be right, right at the same time. You know, Surtz is a candy mint, Surtz is a breath mint. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Pho photons are particles, photons are waves. There's the uh, paradox paradoxicalness, whatever that word would be, is inherent in the nature of creation. Isn't yeah. that one of the lessons of SCI? That's on, right? Yeah. Good. Lessons of SCI is um, the mutual coexistence of opposites. That's one of the basic yeah. premises of the yeah. SCI course. Um, has anybody ever talked to you or had the experience of um, where it feels like you're going backwards in evolution, like devolving? Because <laughs> when I started TM, I was definitely in another place in consciousness. Mm -hmm. It was incredible. Loved everybody. Nature told me everything. It was the opposite of paranoia. You know, everything, everywhere I turned, the world was telling me something I needed to know and giving me something I needed to have. It was incredible. It lasted for 18 months. And I had psychic, you know, I saw things and all this. Anyway, now, you know, <laughs> I'm very aware, because I've studied all the do it, Advaita and stuff, I'm very aware that I'm identified with my thoughts and my feelings and my appetites and my ideas, and that I'm not, I don't, I have the idea that, of absolute consciousness and pure consciousness, and I'm very aware that I don't identify as pure consciousness, but I know that it exists, and I, you know, believe in it, but, so I'm just wondering if anybody you ever interviewed, or, or has ever talked about devolution, or, you know, can you go back? Well, I've had a couple people ask me to take their interview down because they had felt they were awakened when I did the interview, and later on, <laughs> they, d they decided that they weren't, and it, they didn't feel like it should be up there anymore. Um, so there's that. And um, to kind of zoom out to a broader perspective, I, I feel, again, this is a mixture of experience, understanding, and belief, um, I, I feel that you know, the universe is, God is in everything and everything is in God. You know, it's a divine play and ultimately it's a, it's a big giant evolution machine. Um, you know, stars form and explode and form heavy elements which eventually form bodies because bodies can, experience, can be self-referential with regard to consciousness. So there's, and it takes billions of years. But it's this huge evolution machine and um, the force of evolution is inexorable, it's unstoppable. Um, and, you know, to use an analogy Marshy used, if, if a boat's going along and uh, it seems to divert its course, might seem like it's not going towards the goal anymore, but it actually, the captain knows that it had to uh, go around a rock or something. And it's, alt it's actually taking the f most direct course uh, to, the, to the shore, to the port that it's trying to reach. So I, I, I just sort of would feel, if I were you, and I do feel, uh, as me, that um, all is well and wisely put, and um, just keep on trucking, um, and don't sweat it too much, you know, and don't, don't kind of like lament over something that happened 30 years ago in your experience, oh, no. you know. Oh, no, I, don't. I, just, I, I usually lament over what I ate last night. <laughs> <laughs> right. as, as I think my lamenting goes. <laughs> I, think, I think everybody goes through periods of, of just uh, stagnation. Stagnation. Nothing happens. Uh, and waking down, we call it the rot. 
mm. it's it's uh, people have been on spiritual paths for tw two, three, four decades, and they and they wake up one morning and say, I'm the same same Joe I was, you know. In fact, it's even worse. I used to have good experiences. Now I don't have anything. And many times it's it's at that point where transformation can is can begin because you don't know. You start to question, you know, the assumptions you've had about where you're going and, and, and what you believe and, and all this other stuff and you start and that creates an opening where uh, truth can surface yeah. and be seen. Another analogy, I don't know who used this one, is that you know, the train can be in a tunnel and, and it can be going along and it's dark and you can't really see any, any progress. And then you come out the other side of the tunnel and you realize, whoa, uh, there's been a lot of distance covered here, but you just don't know it during the... So I, I would not assume that you were somehow devolved or you know, fallen creature or something. <laughs> you know, I'm sure you're doing fine. Yeah. Thank you. Um, uh, Felix talked about stagnation, so I want to continue that question. Stagnation. Uh, yeah. Rick, have you ever felt a monotony having interviewed 230 people and you want to take a, a shift over or something like that? No, I love it. Um, he, he asked if I ever feel kind of a monotony having interviewed so many people, would I like to take a break from it? Or no, change the change course of your uh, strategy. To do what? How you said you want uh, to interview people who have been having evolution and uh, experiences. Mm -hmm. So do you feel monotony because it is a continuously four years that you have been interviewing, that is 54 weeks, uh -huh. 234 years. Mm -hmm. yeah. So have you felt you want to make any change in the strategy of interviewing people? Well, there are different categories of people and so I do like to mix it up, like I was talking about interviewing Sam Harris who is like this, his, his, his name is synonymous with atheism, mm -hmm. and I think it would be really interesting. But he's a, he's a practicing Buddhist, you know, he, like do, he does intense Buddhist meditation and has for years. Uh, so it's interesting to sort of throw different things in the mix and have different kinds of conversations. If everyone were saying the exact same thing every week, it would get pretty boring. Yes, yeah. thank you. Peter, we'll get to the mic, yeah. As your show is evolving, is it on? Switch the switch. As your show is evolving and likely to continue to evolve, have you thought of um, shifting towards thinking about your audience more? I don't know how big it is, but having some about ten thousand people a day. How many? In, in, about ten thousand people a day engage with it in one way or the other. Either come to the website, watch it on YouTube, listen to the uh, iTunes podcast. Eight, eight to ten, maybe. Wow, that many a day. Yeah. What's what's been the peak? The, uh, the peak? Oh, well, the peak on the website itself was 8,000 something one day, but that doesn't count all the people who listen on iTunes or just watch it on YouTube without coming to the website. Mm -hmm. And I've never actually, it's, it would be harder, it would be impossible to tell that with YouTube because you'd have to go to every single of the 200 and something interviews and see what the, the view count was from day one to day two, and so I don't bother. But it's, it's up there, it's pretty good. Did you ever think of maybe, uh, you know, adding, not necessarily changing, but adding from time to time a format similar to National Public Radio, where you have three or four um, people who are appropriate experts, mm -hmm. and then taking some uh, questions from the uh, uh, you know, congregation that listens to you. And maybe you can have it on a certain topic, just like uh -huh. uh, the lady here was asking about you know, understanding the process of personal experience and evolution. Yeah. So people can bring up questions and then there could be maybe um, feedback to the group more rather than, you know, obviously what you're doing is great, but it's often featuring experiences uh, and, you know, wisdom maybe from these teachers, yeah. but something that's more interactive at this point. I would like to do that. Uh, it's a, there's kind of a technical challenge in terms of getting, you know, doing this on Skype with somebody and getting people to see that simultaneously and ask questions and make sure that they aren't total nutcases asking the questions. If somebody would have, like a radio show, you don't just call in and, and talk. And, and they have a delay thing, so that if somebody yes. starts swearing. And I could always edit the stuff in post-production, but that, that falls on Ralph's shoulders, my friend from high school. So I would like to do that. It's just a question of the technicalities of it. And um, 
there, therefore, it is nice to have like little get-togethers once in a while with more with like we did in North Carolina with right. Francis Bennett and John Mark Stroud, or like we're going to do here in Fairfield in a couple weeks with Francis and Harry and Rufina mm -hmm. and and Kristen, uh, and there we'll have audience interaction. Uh, so, yeah, I'm thinking more. I mean, a lot of what what you talk about for most people is sort of like something they're trying to attain mm -hmm. it may inspire them, but bringing it down to more of a practical level. Like for instance, just like her question, you know, can you, you know, just talking about being stuck in a rut, uh -huh. and you know, people may, you know, you're, you're constantly <coughs> saying, practice make you prone. Excellent so a lot point. of people will be wondering, well, what should I practice? Yeah. And you know, I mean, you know, these are all questions that naturally come up when you yeah. talk about awakening or enlightening, enlightenment, and you know, there's a lot of debate in the press over that, mm -hmm. and all that. So whatever, I just thought of bringing it down yeah. more into a different. Um, <coughs> You know, attention towards the audience as the audience evolving. That's it. Yeah. You don't have to go anywhere, anywhere, but just a thought that came up in it's, this uh, meeting. Yeah, it, it, the whole thing yeah. is evolving, and maybe a time will come where I'll do doing that routinely. It's just ha quite ha haven't quite gotten there yet in terms of the technical setup. Um, but one thing that would help with that perhaps is that you know on the website on batgap.com there's a page called upcoming interviews and it shows all the ones that are scheduled and people could go there and see who is going to be interviewed and check them out a little bit and submit some questions that they'd like me to ask them. It obviously won't be in real time but that would be at least somewhat in the direction of what you're suggesting. Yeah. Yeah. Do you know how much Francis Bennett is Let me talk about that just for a second. Um, so Francis Bennett, good friend of mine, um, he's been to town before. He came and just gave a talk at Morningstar one, one time a couple summers ago. Maybe it was a lot. It's on YouTube. It's on BatGap. And you can check him out. You can check out my interviews with him. He, he wanted to come to Fairfield and do a weekend retreat. And I taught a retreat with Francis one time, not as a kind of a co-teacher, more as a sidekick. Uh, and uh, he's really good. You know, he spent 30 years in in monasteries, not that that would necessarily make him really good, but um, he just has a real depth of insight and a good heart, and he's a, he's a very down-to-earth, what you see is what you get kind of person, no BS. Um, so he's going to come and teach a retreat, and it'll be at the McElhaney House, and it won't be in residence, obviously. Um, I think it might be 140 for the weekend or something. Is that right, John? John Loyne is the guy to talk to if you want to get on that retreat. He's organizing it. John Lennon's this guy over here. Yeah. And um, <laughs> so talk to John if you're interested in that. And then uh, Kristen Kirk is coming. I haven't talked too much about her, but I, I interviewed her about a month or two ago. And uh, she's really got something. She's very kind of, um, I, I prepared for that interview by listening to a whole weekend retreat that she had taught up in Seattle while I was cross country skiing in Jefferson County Park. And, uh, and I just sort of felt like this sort of genuineness and authenticity and depth of insight and um, kind of naturalness and you know uh, people really seem to resonate with her and, and get a lot out of the experience of interacting with her. So she's going to come too and she does something which I don't completely understand exactly what it is but some kind of group healing thing and she's sort of attuned to some subtle levels of creation and, and does something or other. <laughs> she's going to put an ad in the weekly reader and maybe a, maybe a um, a little article explaining what she does. So then during the, re so that'll be kind of outside the retreat. That's a, a Sunday, uh, Sunday afternoon she's going to do it. She might also do something all day Friday. And a bunch of people who kind of um, hang around her might be coming into Fairfield for the retreat and for, and for that. Um, then s Saturday night during the retreat, we're going to have this kind of forum discussion. And we, we, there was some thought to have it be a totally public thing, but for various reasons, we couldn't do it that way, both scheduling and in terms of what we were saying earlier about the intimacy of this experience of subtle perception. A lot of people just, some of the participants in this forum just wanted a more private, quiet um, setting in which to kind of come out and <laughs> on this particular topic and didn't want to have sort of a come one, come all thing at, at, morning, at a public venue. So that'll be Saturday evening during the retreat for those who are on the retreat, but it will also be put on BatGap later on, which is ironic because thousands of people are going to see it anyway. But, <laughs> but somehow these folks felt, a couple of them 
felt more comfortable just doing it in a more private setting, you know, not being open to every question under the book or whatever. So that'll, that'll be kind of an interesting discussion about, you know, what subtle perception or celestial perception is. Is it, is it something that, should, that we should strive for? Does it come automatically? Can it be taught? Uh, is it a distraction or is it kind of a, an, an inevitable unfoldment in the course of our evolution? We'll just sort of go at it from all angles uh, and uh, discuss it. So that'll be happening Saturday night during the retreat. And that's the May. So the retreat itself is like Friday the 23rd through Sunday the 25th at McElhaney. It's reasonable. In fact, she said she wouldn't turn anybody away. She, people can come in for, for free if they don't, if they really can't afford it. But I think it's like fifteen, twenty bucks or something for the. the uh, no, Saturday afternoon after the retreat ends, she's going to do a thing at McElhaney where she does this this healing thing, and the, she's also, I think, going to do something all day Friday. I'm not sure where. Maybe McElhaney. I don't know what. What she'll we'll work. She'll work that out, or we'll work it out. It'll be in the weekly reader, yeah. So, and I, I, I probably I won't edit this out of the, the tape that we're recording here because people watching this on YouTube could still come to Fairfield and, and join in on this stuff if they want to. So. I would just like to say, uh, this event, I forgot to mention this earlier, this event is being sponsored by Waking Down of Fairfield. This event that we're doing right here right now, here, yes. Right now, and if you're interested in getting on our mailing list, just leave, leave your... Uh, email address there. We'll let you know about all the activities that we have in Fairfield. Uh, and there's also a website, wakingdown.org, uh, which is, uh, gives a good explanation of what it's all about. Good. And also, I, I've interviewed Fax and his wife Sharon on Bat Gap. They were my fifth interview, I think. So you can watch that there if you want to hear more from them. Uh, I've also interviewed quite a few Waking Down teachers, um, you know, Steve and Winifred Boggs, uh, Samuel and Linda Bonder, or Samuel Bonder, Samuel Bonder, Bonder and Linda Bonder, Ted Strauss, Ted, Ted and Hillary, and, um, uh, Sandra, Glickman. Sandra Glickman, so uh, Alan Morlock, Alan Morlock, yep. So, and there on that gap, there's an alphabetical index of all the people on, in the right-hand column. So all these names I just mentioned, if you want to hear, learn more about them, you can click on the, those links and see their interviews. Great. Okay. Thank you. I think it's a wrap. Thank, Thank you, you all. Rick. Thanks for coming.